Okay, here we go. We're taping. Hey, John. Hey, Nikita. Um, so uh, we were scheduled to talk today, um, and we made this plan before the war started. And so this was not supposed to be about anything in particular. We, you know, we talk every now and again, and it's a chat between friends, and it's what's on your mind, what's on my mind. And and since the war started, I went back and forth a few times on whether we should record. And I might still chicken out and not publish after we tape. I don't know. Um, but But I thought I should try to talk publicly and uh, as authentically as I can um, because I don't know what else to do. Um, and so I'll, I'll just try to share what this moment is, uh, how it feels and what I think. Uh, and uh, it's not going to be easy because I'm not sure what I feel and uh, it's very hard to think. Um, one of the one of the feelings that uh, does seem to sustain itself is uh, is the following. It's also hard to describe. When I woke up and I found out that the war has started, and I listened to Putin's address about that, um, I was in complete shock, as is everybody that I know personally. Um, and we're still in that state. But um, as the, that first day of war progressed, um, you know, by the middle of it, I thought, um, I felt, I, I, I can't, I don't have a word for the feeling. It's not shame, but it's something in the vicinity of shame for the feeling of shock that I felt in the morning. Because in hindsight, um, I don't think, this should come as a surprise. I think uh, it is, it makes sense. It's, it's, I think this is what the Russian state is. I think it's what it's been. Uh, I think it's what the Soviet state used to be. It's a system that's built on brute force. Um, Putin is in power in Russia because his competitors are either dead or in jail or uh, had to leave the country. Um, and, uh, and this is how it works. This is how the system works. It's not just Putin. It's how the system works. The system was here before Putin was born. The Soviet Union operated the same way. Um, and it makes sense. And it's, it's a hard realization uh, because I think we were willfully blind to this state of affairs. And uh, it has all kinds of implications to what I think about Russia, the Russian people, myself, what share of responsibility I bear for this. Um, you know, um, we allowed... Uh, this to be the 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 case. Um, and there's a in his first address when he talked about not the war. He was at the time talking about the recognition of the breakaway republics as independent states. He talked about Ukraine as a country that is kind of not real. It doesn't have sovereignty. It's just a puppet of the United States, um, and it's not. It, it doesn't have its own agency. Um, I think the reality is that Ukraine is trying to gain sovereignty and it's very hard for them because uh, they are just geographically, they're opposed between two large militaristic forces. Uh, and and uh, they, you know, it, it they're, they're pulled either one way or another, it's hard to be your own person in that position, but they're trying to be that. I think Russia doesn't have sovereignty. Putin does, 
right? Putin can make decisions and implement them and see what consequences happen, um, but the Russian people don't have a decision-making power. Um, you know, I hope, I want to believe that most Russians are as shocked by this and as I am. Um, everybody I know is. Uh, I have secondhand knowledge of people who are not, who think this is, who support uh, the war, who bought Putin's, um, you know, view of the world that he puts forward. I don't know any people like that, but I know people who know such people. And so my hope is um, most Russians feel in the vicinity of how I feel. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but I also think it doesn't matter because we are not calling the shots. We're not even influencing the decisions a whole lot. Um, and um, and this is where I'm at at this time. I've been going, you know, through different kinds of emotions. They're um, all in the general kind of area of despair, but, um, you know, um, uh, at times I laugh and at times I feel energized. Uh, not exactly knowing why, and other times not so much. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What are what are the prospects? How much hope can there be that Russia will? Um, I don't know, become a, a truly democratic state, whatever that is. I'm not saying that the United States at this point is an exemplar of uh, democracy, but we're certainly closer to it than Russia is. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I have to acknowledge that I, the, the shock that you're experiencing reminds me of when um, George Bush invaded Iraq back in... Uh, beginning of uh, 2002, I guess it was. And, you know, he we had already invaded Afghanistan and there was a lot of support for that. And then it was clear that the Bush administration was thinking about going into Iraq. And I, I think most people didn't think it was, it was, I thought of it as just tough talk. Let's get rid mm -hmm. of Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein once and for all. And then suddenly they did it. And I remember watching CNN, you know, the, the rockets and bombs going off. There were American journalists in, uh, in Baghdad who were witnessing firsthand the uh, shock and awe campaign. Um, and I, I also felt... Shock and awe campaign. Yeah. I, I felt afraid and ashamed. Um, and so... I, my feelings about Russia are complicated. Um, I just had a student and, you know, I teach a class called War and Science and uh, it's based on my book, The End of War. You know, this kind of optimistic view that we can get rid of war once and for all someday. And uh, I had a student who came from Russia in my class really smart kid. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a paper basically saying, trying to help us to understand Russia and to understand its traumatic history of being invaded, going back to uh, at least Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. Napoleon wreaked havoc on, um, on Russia. And then of course, World War I and, uh, and worst of all, World War II. Uh, and Just, the civil war in between. Pardon me? And the civil war in between. Yeah. And so he said, you know, he, he wasn't trying to excuse Russia, but he said, you should understand, if you understand Russia's traumatic history, you can understand 
how what sometimes seems like aggressive offensive posturing is actually uh, defensive and designed to keep it safe yeah. from yeah. some of these attacks. I I don't think you know Putin is just a he's a terrible person, and I guess what I'm asking you is, can Russia? get past this idea of the strong man leader and uh, you know the kind of who's whipping up nationalist uh feelings and go to a more rational um foreign policy or whatever you want to call it is do you see that in i mean i imagine you're very pessimistic right now but what's the hope for that yeah so um I wanted to say at the outset, I, I, I think I'm going to regret some things I'm going to say today because, uh, as I said, my thinking is not very straight right now. And uh, I'm sure I'll be going back and forth on various uh, th thoughts and feelings. Um, you're right. Currently, I'm pretty, uh, my, my view is pretty grim. I'm, I'm always the optimist Russian. I'm like, you know, people smile at me and uh, sometimes condescendingly uh, saying, oh, idealist Nikita, he always tries to be productive. He always sees some kind of a hope on the horizon uh, that maybe not everything is as grim as it is. Um, I'm not that right now. Um, I don't think that the reason we have Putin is a desire of Russians for a strong man. I think, as I said, I think what Russians desire doesn't matter. Um, I think that the reason, well, you know, again, I think I, it's not that I think that I'm thinking that right now, it's not, um, I'm very skeptical of my analytical skills at this point. Um, but a thought that I had recently is Russians, probably for historical reasons, probably because of the Soviet period and maybe before then, uh, you know, maybe you can go as far as, you know, to say Russians were, uh, you know, uh, freed from serfdom, which is the Russian version of slavery, within the five years of black Americans. It's recent. And, and obviously that liberation was not complete. Uh, if you look at the Soviet state, there was its own kind of slavery there. So I, you, somebody can write a series of books try to analyze why, you know, what the causes are, what the source of um, this powerlessness is. But my feeling is Russians suck at organizing, at talking to one another and um, doing something together. And the people who are good at organizing are the KGB types. And I think it's not even because they're like really good at organizing together, like they're the ones who know how to communicate and build structures. I think it's because their power does not require broad consensus, coming to the same agreement. It, it, it requires scheming individual, you know, how did Stalin get into power? That was not in the plan. Lenin was advised, you know, the, there's a farewell, um, what do they call it? Like, um, uh, like a will that Lenin, um, wrote that was supposed to be read. He was ill. He knew he's not going to last long. And he wrote this document to be read at the party assembly with his thoughts on how to go forward. One of the things there was that Stalin should not be 
in power. He's dangerous and he should be um, removed from powerful positions. By the time Lenin wrote that, Stalin already had the power. Hold on a second. Let me just uh, get somebody calling. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. By the time Lenin wrote that, Stalin was already in power. Uh, not officially. He was the secretary of the party. This is why the Soviet leaders, you know, you had presidents, we had general secretary. That was not by design. The general secretary is not the leader of the state. Or it, it, that was not the idea. Um, the reason that title became the title of the leader of the state is because the guy who was the general secretary got the power uh, and he did that by making his own individual strategy for seizing power um, and he killed his competitors and he made some of his competitors leave and then some of those who left were killed like Trotsky, um, he was killed abroad with an ice pick. And, and I think that's the genesis of power in Russia. This is, this is the kind of person, the kind of people who become powerful. It's not those who want to get together and talk and f vote on a decision, figure out how uh, to move forward. It's individuals who are good at navigating the social reality to amass individual power. And then there are, you know, there's a class of these people. Some are better at it than others. And they do have some kind of loyalty to one another or to the organization, uh, but that is murky. I don't know how, you know, again, Stalin killed people who were in his own party and who were comrades at one point, quote unquote comrades. Um, and, um, and, so I don't know about the question of, of loyalty, how exactly it works between them, but I think power in Russia belongs to those kinds of people and they don't need the approval of others. They know how to manipulate others. Um, there is also, pick your date, you know, when things went wrong can be any date in the last 100 years, a little more than that. Um, but one date that might work is 1993. This was when Russia had a constitutional crisis. It was not clear who had higher authority, the president, the capitalist, ostensibly Democrat president, Boris Yeltsin, or the parliament, elected parliament, who was controlled by the communists. And the president used the army, tanks, shoot at the building of the parliament to establish who's in charge. Um, you might, you know, you looking back on history, you impose your own vision on it, as Putin did in his address, so you can um, make your own narrative. One narrative would be that 91 to 93 was like Russia's shot at being a free country, at being a sovereign nation. Um, and this is how it ended. Uh, president established his authority. A constitution was signed, uh, a constitution that shifted the balance of power to the president. That constitution actually was drafted by, with the help of the US. It's on the USA the website. Is you know, the work we're, we're, we're proud to showcase to you on our website. You said, you know, helping Russians um, get their constitution. 
And then, you know, 96 is an election. Uh, some people say, including Medvedev, who was president of the country, ostensibly, for four years, you know, Putin's uh, standing. Um, he said at one point that um, Yeltsin lost in that election, that the election was rigged. Even if he didn't lose in terms of, like, counting the votes, he started the that year the, uh, when the election held was held uh, with approval ratings. I think it was single digits. I think it was like 7%. Uh, and the reason he managed to get his approval rating higher and get people to vote is because there was a massive campaign and that campaign was financed and um, uh, had consultants from America. That's you know a part of what's happened. This is not to say um, I'm not trying to blame, you know, America. Uh, I'm not trying to say they're the ones who are responsible. Uh, I can say I'm responsible. You know, I, I don't know who there is enough blame to be spread around, and uh, I don't know if that's what we need to do. Um, but but you could make those arguments too. Anyway, in terms of hope, uh, I don't have a whole lot of hope now. I don't see exactly how a change happens. As I said, people who are opposing Putin are either dead or in jail or abroad. Navalny right now, is still there. Navalny right now mm -hmm. is um, he's in jail, but he's also in court, which the court proceedings, uh, that's a new one for Russia, are taking place in the jail. They brought the court to him uh, and he's wearing his prison garb during the proceedings, which is not what's supposed to happen. Uh, but he's in court. They came up with a couple of new cases for him. That, uh, he's not going to be out unless there's like a revolution happening. I don't see how a revolution is going to happen. Um, so... So I, I and, and the people, you know, there are, when the war started, so yesterday there were demonstrations, there were protests, anti-war protests, not huge, um, which is understandable, I think, because people are scared and, and they feel powerless and they don't feel like a protest would ha uh, would change anything. None of the protests that have been happening in the last 10 years or so really had any kind of a positive effect. Um, so, but the protest happened. We have, uh, I think a little more than a thousand people detained, uh, across the country. And I think that'll be the, con that, that, that's it. That's what the protest accomplished. Some people are detained. Some will, will be jailed probably. Um, so I don't see a mechanism for a change. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's on hope. Let me just show you. This is what I was going to show you. This is a book that uh, came out in November um, and caused a real sensation. It's it's a big, dense, scholarly book, and it immediately became a bestseller. Got a lot of attention. Um, I, I recently ordered it from Amazon. It's going to take about a month for it to get to me, but I'm waiting for it. Yeah, it's um, so you've read about it, and uh, it's it it's a new story of humanity, retelling the emergence of civilization, and um, it's an anthropologist named David Graeber, who died right after finishing the book. Uh, tragically, he wasn't that old, and it, he's an anarchist, and the co-author David Wengro. I'm not sure what his politics are, but probably, you know, far left, progressive. Um, and, and the co-author is, I think, an archaeologist, right? Yeah. Sorry. David Wengro is an archaeologist in England. And basically what they do is just show that humans politically have always been really inventive and experimental. And we've we've had all kinds of societies. So the conventional narrative 
um, and especially as told by Darwinians and and people who like Hobbes. You know, Hobbes said before civilization it was a war of all against all, and you need a strong leader to organize people and make them behave, all that kind of stuff. And um, so it's a very it's saying that authoritarian societies are are sort of necessary to bring peace and order and prosperity. And these guys just blow that up by showing that uh, there has been all this diversity in human social arrangements, um, including, of course, brutal repressive regimes with monarchs that exterminate opponents, but also complex societies in the Middle East and Central and South America and elsewhere uh, that were non-hierarchical, that were relative, relatively uh, egalitarian, which have not been discussed all that much in the uh, anthropological literature. So the question that arises, I mean, and their message is, they're trying to be hopeful. They're saying, yeah, you look at the world today and you've got a lot of these hierarchical authoritarian societies, even so-called democracies like the United States, um, we can do better. We can look at the past and see all these different ways that people have lived and we can do better than what we have now. We can be less militaristic. Uh, capitalism doesn't have to be so predatory. We can have a, a more benign um, political arrangement than we have right now. The question that arises in the book that they don't answer that well is how did we get stuck with these hierarchical, patriarchal, violent political structures? And I, you know, I just wrote a review of this book for Scientific America. Actually, I wrote it a while ago. It's going to be published next week, I hope. Um, and I, of course, brought war in and said that war is the answer. It's because once societies become militaristic and see war as a solution to a lot of different problems, both internally and externally, um, then war becomes a really important part of those cultures. And war has this way of spreading from one society to other societies that don't want anything to do with it. Um, you know, if your neighbor is violent and invading you, what are you going to do? You can either surrender or try to run away, um, uh, or you fight back. And so you become, you adopt the practices of war, whether or not you want them. That's the, that's the terrible logic of, of, uh, of war. And, um, so this book just made me reinforce my, this feeling that I've had that war is just this ridiculous, stupid, illogical behavior uh, that evolved uh, for, I mean, it, it does solve problems, especially if your neighbor is warlike and is attacking you. Uh, but over time, it's just not a sensible way to resolve disputes. It's, it's uh, what Bob Wright would call a non-zero sum, a negative sum. Um, exchange where both parties end up devastated, especially in wars like World War I. And I think the reaction a lot of people are having, and this is, I'm trying to look at it for an upside in mm -hmm. the invasion mm -hmm. of Ukraine. People are looking at it and like, really? Like 2022 and you still got like a big bad country rolling tanks into another country and shooting people and blowing shit up. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And we call ourselves civilized. And unfortunately, it's not just Russia. It's the United States has been behaving this way for a really long time. Yeah. So yeah. I hope that somehow the invasion of Ukraine leads you know, here I am like <laughs> beating my favorite drum, but I really hope it, it leads to some kind of discussion about how to get past this ridiculous behavior once and for all. So I'm distressed by Americans who are saying, 
Biden isn't tough enough. You know, we got to do what? What? We need to put our troops in there? That's going to make the situation better? I don't know what the There's solution a... is. But it can't I, be that. I keep... I keep coming back to uh, like a metaphor that keeps uh, emerging in my psyche when I think about all this is the metaphor of domestic abuse. So when I talked about my shock at this happening, at the war starting, and then I thought that I shouldn't be shocked, um, I, I compare it to Imagine a woman who's in a relationship. She's a, she has a husband who humiliates her and beats her up uh, every now and again. And then he crosses some new line. He hits her child or her mother or rapes her sister or something. And she's in shock. How could he do this? And um, and maybe she shouldn't be shocked. This, this is what's been happening. It's just escalated or it's just happened in a, place she didn't expect but she's been in this relationship she's been uh beaten up by him um and uh if i extend that metaphor to the american strategy so america and my understanding is this is an american initiative it's not all of nato uh there was some resistance from other allies but america uh or NATO uh, with with American um, with with America being the initiator of this, promised uh, Georgia and Ukraine that they're going to be a part of NATO at some future juncture. Um, and if I extend that that domestic abuse metaphor, it's like there's a woman who lives with a husband who beats her up, and there's a guy who wants to have an affair with this woman and says, you know, you should really be your own person. You should stand up to your husband, should be independent, and I'll support you. Um, and, uh, you know, you should have a relationship with me instead. Of course, you're going to continue living with your husband. Uh, you know, he's not suggesting she moves in. Because uh, you can't do, like, Ukraine can't magically lift itself up geographically and go to a different part of the world. It's a neighbor of Russia. Um, and it used to be a part of the Soviet Union. And Putin would describe, he in his speech said that, uh, that the borders of Ukraine as we know them now are arbitrary and they were designed by Lenin and Stalin and Khrushchev, whatever. The point is, there's this guy, this this you know new boyfriend, who is actually a business partner partner of the husband. Right? They have deals, and they have, um, you know, it's some some of these deals they compete. Other, uh, they are they are actually working together. There's money being transferred, and the woman is encouraged to be her own person and she's she should allow be allowed to have a relationship with somebody else if she wants to but she's living she's coming back to that apartment uh and so yeah that's not a recipe for things playing so so now she's being brutally beaten by the husband and the boyfriend says well i'm gonna send him a tough voicemail and I'm going to renegotiate some of our deals and he's going to bear economic consequences. Um, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, American military involvement would be better because that would be World War III. But it, it just sucks. The whole situation sucks. And, um, and there are people who are being killed and there are houses where people live that are being bombed. And I, yeah, right now I have grim view of our situation, both the Russian situation, but, but also more broadly.
There is, uh, I, I want to say one more thing uh, because I'll forget. Otherwise, you brought up that book. That book uh, also came to my mind, so I haven't read it. Uh, I'm waiting for it to appear in the mail. But I've read little quotes and passages, and I've listened to an interview or two of the author. And there's one thing that um, stuck in my mind. Correct me if I'm butchering this. Maybe I'm, uh, you know, I didn't get it right. But I think somewhere in the book, the authors make an argument that some of these soci- some of these hunter gatherer societies were not uh, just small tribes. Uh, they were expansive. You know, they covered different tribes together, covered a large territory, and there was a kind of a society of these tribes, and they had some freedoms that we don't. And one freedom uh, like that is the freedom to travel freely. And the authors argue, again, the way I remembered from reading just the passage, is that the freedom to travel freely, it, it's not just about the ability to leave, leave. It's also about knowing that where you're going, you're going to have a life. You're not going to... Um, you're not going to be uh, something. something somebody will, is going to extend help or at least let you in. And, um, you know, I'm right now in Russia. I would rather not be in Russia right now. I can't be elsewhere because I need a visa to go elsewhere and I can't get one. So I, I just, this is not, this is no open end. It's just, you know, an open end of thought. It's uh, speculation. I, I, I was thinking because, okay, so this situation also uh, brings some dark thoughts about Russians and, as a people, which is like, like, this is not unusual. This was before the war. This Russians talk shit about Russians as a people. There's a kind of an inferiority complex. Uh, and I have always been the guy who, I love Russians. I love Russia. I love Russian culture. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot uh, of great qualities to the people. Um, and now it's just getting harder to have that kind of uh, feelings about ourselves. But I was wondering what would happen to the notion of Russia and Russianness if we could go anywhere? Like, what would what, a lot of people would leave and some people would stay? And what would happen if everybody could go everywhere? Who would come to Russia? Which part of Russians would leave? Uh, Ukrainians want to be a part of Europe. They want to live in a European country. What if Ukrainians individually could just decide to do that? I'll just go and become, you know, build a life in Germany without having to uh, go through this complex bureaucracy that doesn't let everybody everybody in. What, what would, would the world look like if people could just travel freely and not be stopped by these borders? I don't know what would happen. I mean, you know, there's an argument for borders. Uh, there are a lot of arguments for borders. But that's just um, a thought that um, did come to my mind, so I wanted to share it. I, I don't remember an explicit discussion of freedom to move in the book, but there were pretty detailed descriptions of remarkable societies. The Iroquois Federation gets a lot of attention. This um, this uh, collection of of tribes in the Northeast United States that um, had a, a loose um, government connecting them, and uh, that very explicitly devised ways to avoid uh, military conflict and to minimize the subjugation of any tribe to another or of any person to another. And one of the themes of the book is, one of the things that was a revelation to me was 
that some of the Iroquois, especially this one guy who was a great leader, I forget his name, uh, traveled to Europe and went to France mm-hmm. and sort of took in French society. And this would have been, I think, middle or late 18th century. So this is before the French Revolution. And, um, and he was appalled at the misery he saw, at, at the inequality and the lack of basic freedoms that people endured in France. And he said, how can you live like this? And supposedly his critique of, of uh, French society in turn, it was written up um, by a French intellectual, and this inspired some of the political ideas of uh, of the Enlightenment. You know that humans have basic dignity and rights and all that uh, sort of stuff. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot more people now, and uh, and countries rightfully are concerned about economic security and even you know physical security so i think as an ideal a world in which borders don't matter that much is wonderful but um but right now uh you know i I can understand if i'm the leader of the united states for example would i just say that anybody can come here who wants to um that could be really disruptive So I don't know what I do. (laughs) I can snipe from the sidelines, uh, but I would hate to have to make those sorts of, those sorts of choices myself. It's really interesting thinking about that in the context of uh, Russia, which even among its own people does seem to have inspired this kind of love and hate queasy mixture of feelings i'm watching a very cheesy cartoonish show called the great it's about catherine the great i think it's on hulu i've heard about it it's just very loosely based on the life of catherine the great but um one repeated theme is the the fatalism of russians and that you know they keep saying something really horrible happens and they just kind of go ah you know it's russia um, they love it, but they see kind of something uh, really flawed at the core of the uh, of the country's personality. I don't know if I believe that stuff so much. I'm still hoping that this whole adventure of Putin's will will backfire in a way that ends up with him being ousted from power. I don't know if that's uh, if that's reasonable at this point. Um, And uh, as you say, some Russians probably, quite a few Russians probably think this is great. Yeah, let's like uh, kick ass like the old days, you know, take back this country. The narrative that was put forth, and it's hard for me to understand how people buy it, uh, but I know that some do, is that... The Ukrainian regime is this neo-Nazi regime backed by the United States. And what Putin is doing is he's defending people. This is not an attack. This is not an invasion. This is not, he's not waging war. He's just getting rid of a corrupt uh, neo-Nazi government to liberate the people of Ukraine to then make their own decision as to, I mean, this is, I don't know how people buy it, but some do, some do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, another, I, I seem to be thinking in these like images and metaphors. Um, another one I had is of Russia or maybe going further. It's hard to go further than that right now in my thinking, but my general tendency is to grab the overreaching metaphors for the nature of reality as such. Um, But 
certainly Russia right now feels like a kind of a prison. And I'm thinking, so now I think I, I, I had this thought, you know, Navalny was my candidate. Uh, the one time he was allowed to be a part of any kind of an election. This was a mayoral election in Moscow. I voted, I campaigned for him. And I think I, th I had this thought, he really is representing me sitting in that prison, being behind those bars, wearing that prison garb. Uh, I feel like I'm in a very, very comfortable wing of a prison. He's, he, he's getting the solitary confinement almost. Um, like people are not allowed to talk to him. Um, and I live, you know, I go to a cafe and I get uh, a good coffee and I can walk around and for, for the time being anyway, uh, because I don't know what the sanctions are going to do. But for the time being, I, a lot of people here in this city are going about as if nothing has happened. Um, I'm in St. Petersburg, yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a comfortable life within a prison. Uh, it feels like it, and uh, and the tendency for the overreaching metaphor is you know there are we uh, one of the themes that we usually talk about when there's not a fucking war happening um, is uh, you know schools of spiritual thought, religions, mystical ideas. There are a bunch of those. I think that this whole world is that you know from ancient Gnostic beliefs to Scientology. There is a way of looking at the world as a prison. Um, that sounds, that rings true for me right now. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think we've talked about this. Before. I'm sorry, I'm being so gloomy. <laughs> this is, no, that's okay. This is not what, I, not usually what I usually do. do. <laughs> <laughs> title. I I, uh, I teach the parable of the cave to my students um, every semester. Mm -hmm. You know, I love it because it's just it's like a really deep metaphor. And what and one of the things I tell my students is that um, if you if you think there's no way to get out of the cave and to a, a higher, a better world, a higher reality, whatever, that we're just in the cave. That's the human condition to be in the cave. And so it's actually kind of phony for Socrates to suggest that we can get out of the cave, like normal humans can't do that. Then you might reasonably conclude that there is no cave. The whole, the metaphor of the cave only makes sense if there's an inside the cave and the outside of the cave. If right. There, if you can't right, ever right. get to the outside of the cave, then there is no cave. There is no, I would argue that there is no prison. Uh, and that this is reality, make the most of it that you can. There is an issue that, that has come up for me a lot, um, especially over the last couple of years. You know, I, I've been immersed in this attempt to understand quantum mechanics, which goes very deep into the cave and the nature of reality and all that stuff. And meanwhile, outside, literally outside my window, in some cases, there's a Black Lives Matter protest. There are Me Too protests happening. There's Donald Trump behaving like this bizarre thug all this terrible stuff is happening, inequality, all the, you know, the threats to democracy in my country. And I've wondered what my responsibility is. This is going to be a little pretentious, but you know, I'm a, I'm a writer and I'm a teacher. So I, ha I, I need to think about how I'm spending my time and I, am I being responsible? Mm -hmm. um, I just had a speaker talk to my school, David Chalmers, who's this very prominent philosopher who's written a lot about consciousness. He has a new book out sort of there somewhere um, on whether we live in a simulation mm -hmm. or whether we're headed toward a world in which virtual reality replaces, you know, real reality. Mm -hmm. And he basically says, 
Well, virtual reality is, it's so, it can be so real that it's, there's, doesn't matter. You know, it's, we should just accept it as real. And if this is a simulation, no big deal. We can still have pleasant or painful experiences. And it, it I like David Chalmers, but I thought for this major intellectual to be talking about virtual realities and the simulation hypothesis at a time when the world is fucking burning. Climate change, uh, rampant capitalism, uh, militarism is still a huge problem for a major intellectual to be saying fun things about whether we're living in a simulation and whether that's kind of cool. Uh, it, it sort of makes me sick. And yet I could be accused of doing the same thing when I, you know, I just wrote a column for scientific American. The title was, um, does quantum mechanics reveal that life is but a dream? And I was mm -hmm. I'm playing with these ideas that, that reality isn't real and all this kind of stuff. So I, I don't know. I sort of feel like intellectual life is an escape for me. I need it. I can't just stare at horrible images of misery all the time and try to figure out what to do about that. I, I need to get away into, I don't know, trivial, nonsensical, philosophical issues like whether this thing we're doing right here is reality or whether we're in a, like, you know, a simulated hyperverse or I I don't I don't know if they're necessarily trivial. I mean, I I it, we've talked a lot about psychedelic experience, mystical experience, different uh, schools of thought on that, ancient religions. Uh, you paraphrase Bhagavad Gita, which I actually, by the way, just started reading finally because um, for the first time I think a good Russian translation appeared, and uh, th there are a bunch of translations, but all of the earlier ones didn't seem good and this one I trust. Um, there are ways of looking at, I mean, if you take the religious path seriously and you think this world is whatever, a creation of a God or uh, a kind of Buddhist, Hinduist view that's a little more nuanced, I think, for, well, I don't need to pass judgment on, on you know, in, in passing on particular versions. But if if it's not what it seems, um, and you take that seriously, then that might have implications on how do you navigate it, and um, and how you deal with the realities of this world. You know, keeping in mind that it's uh, more fluid than it appears, or something. Um, so it doesn't. I it can be, but I don't think it has to be trivial. I think it depends on how you treat the issue and the view and the, it, it, it's, it, you know, what is your personal relationship to the hypothesis? If you're just like throwing th ideas around and, you know, nothing too bad about that either. Just have a fun conversation, entertain different ideas, but it can be a, a, a you know, a framework that you use to navigate the world. And it might be in particular cases, an effective one. Um, I get that. I, I, what I keep, one of the things that I do, you know, I've, I've actually got a draft of this book on quantum mechanics. And, and uh, so I just keep being dragged back into the world by things that are happening. And it seems to me that whatever your philosophy is, whatever your metaphysics is, at the core of it, it, it needs to deal with human suffering, with mm -hmm, human mm -hmm. pain, and with, you know, death, the certainty of loss, all the, I mean, if you're talking about what is real, you know, the philosophers of physics get caught up in, well, what is an electron anyway? Is it a wave or is it a particle? Or, you know, and who gives a shit? What, when you're talking about what real, what is real, what you're really asking is what matters. 
what matters to us as humans. Right. And right. so your philosophy has to address. Right. Yeah. Pain and suffering and, and injustice and all the things that actually um, define our lives and distinguish us. Some people suffer a lot more and encounter a lot more injustice than others. Something has to be done about that. Um, there's a, there's a quote attributed to Lenin. So when Lenin died, the writer Maxim Gorky, who, who was this major at the time, I think he was like an international celebrity at the time. I don't know how many Americans know who Gorky is these days. <laughs> at least one. Um, he wrote an obituary. Uh, you know, Lenin the Great, whatever, thinker, mover, etc. He was you know, very enamored with him. And he recounts this scene that um, like when I read it, I, I, I couldn't help but interpret it in a way that is it's definitely not intended to be interpreted this way, but I can't help to still interpret it that way. And the scene is Lenin, I think it's in Gorky's and his, um, uh, I forget if it was his wife or just uh, a woman uh, his, he was living with at the time, whatever partner we would say these days. Uh, they're, uh, they're at the, their apartment and they're listening to Beethoven. And Lenin says, this is incredible music. This is just magical. Um, but I can't listen to it for too long because what it makes you feel is you want to just pat humans on the head and say how incredible that you are able to, to create such, such beauty. Um, and you shouldn't be petting people on the heads. Uh, if you, there's something like at the time like this, I forget the exact quote. There are two things he says. One is, uh, I think, I hope I'm not misquoting. I think he says they shouldn't be patting them on the head. You should be hitting them with a stick on that head. And, uh, and, and the other, and the other is if you pat them on the head, uh, they might bite your hand off. But the, the point he's making, the, 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 the thing that, that stuck with me as the thing that I clearly misinterpret, but I can't stop myself from doing so is his, um, he says we, we, we can be like enamored and, and in awe of the beautiful things that people create. Uh, but all that is, is making pretty things while they're in hell. We should be changing the situation. We should be, uh, you know, um, making the world something different than a hell and not just creating beautiful music in hell. The way I misinterpret it is what if he meant it literally? What if he had... He clearly didn't. He was a, like a, a warrior atheist. He, he was very much against all religion. But what if he meant it literally? What if he felt this is a hell and his project was to not just claim, like his atheism was not just, I don't think there's a God, but, uh, but I don't think there should be a God. And we should overthrow the fucker and we should murder him and we should establish our own order in the hell that he put us in. Which I think like at a certain level of abstraction, like, so he was an anti-religious person. He was an atheist. He didn't think there's a God or that people should believe in a God. He also was an anti-monarchist, right? He wouldn't say there is no Tsar. Like, literally, there is, like, there's a guy who has that title and who has the power. But when you say, like, you can, you can say there's no tsar, there's no king, 
like, okay, not the metaphor. Let's say there's a slave. Somebody is owned by a different person. And that person, that slave says, I don't have a master, right? They can mean it in different ways. One way, literally, I mean, you clearly has a master. There's a guy who chained you and uh, whose will you can't go against. But you can also say, I don't have a master. Like this is an unfortunate circumstance that some fucking guy thinks he's my master and has the power to make me do things. But really, he's not my master. I'm my own person. So you can have the same kind of idea about a king. Like, do I have uh, a president? I don't know what I should call Putin. Is he my boss? Uh, in some ways, he is. All of ours, uh, you know, he's, 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 he rules all of us. In other ways, I can say, I do not consent to this. Fuck that. I'm going to live my life as if I'm a free person and I'm going to hope that this is going to pan out. Uh, and so I think you can, at a certain level of abstraction, you can claim that Lenin's atheism, uh, you know, you can interpret it as intellectually, I think, like I try to analyze the reality and I come to the conclusion that there is no God. Or you can say, I make the choice to claim there is no God. Uh, the order of things is not what it should be, what it's supposed to be, or what it's going to be. I can make my own destiny. I can make my own uh, view of the world. And I say that even if there is a God, I actually kind of agnostic position, you know, maybe there's a force that we could call a God, but if that such force exists, I'm going to say that's not God. I'm going to try to kill that force and free myself from that force. So that's just an association. It's not really actionable or relevant in any meaningful way, but uh, it's just a, a thought that uh, I've had for a long time. Well, it seems to me that's, that is related to the question of whether you accept that we're in a cave or, or just say, right. no, we're right. not in a cave. Um, the, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, you can talk about these ideas in a, in a very abstract way, but some people are in chains. Some people yeah. Yeah. are in prison cells. Yeah. And, you know, there, there is injustice in the world. You now are in Russia and you are saying some things that are very critical of your government. Um, I don't know if there are potential consequences for you when you say these things. That's a big difference between you and me. I can say anything I want about my government. Nobody's going to come for me. Right, uh, right. It's not in the near future. I'm, I'm too tiny and insignificant. But even if I weren't, you know, we do have free speech here. You over there, not I don't so know. Much, so you know journalists are murdered yeah. by the state, yeah. uh, apparently. And this is what I hear. So, uh, you know, at some point, metaphysics gets real you know yeah. it it and i guess that's all i'm saying is that it needs to i'd like it when philosophy at least sort of acknowledges the stuff that does matter to people uh you know heartbreak and death and the yearning for connection and at the same time, the yearning for some kind of independence. And, oh man, we're such a complicated species. Uh, and I, I'm still hopeful in spite of it all, but uh, I, I, I realize that things must look very, very dark right now from where you are in the world. I mean, cause they look dark over here. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm protected, but you're right in the middle of it. I mean, I'm not being bombed. There are people who are being bombed right now. And that's, that's, uh, my girlfriend just came back from work and, uh, a big part of her frustration with this moment is she's supposed to show up at an office and do her job and the other people in that office are just sitting there and doing their job. And me and her have been finding it very, very hard to do 
anything except for updating the news feeds and uh, I don't know, experiencing whatever we're experiencing. And so, you know, you can say I'm in the middle of it or, but, but there are a lot of people around me who were in exact same position as I am in the same city, actually in like worse position than I am. Um, you know, there are people who are poorer than me. There are people who have jobs that they hate. I'm, I'm living a pretty good life and nobody's right. I mean, right now, uh, nobody is, uh, inflicting explicit violence on me. I'm not uh, in jail. There is not, you know, you may say there is a risk, but then there's always risk of all kinds of, I mean, we're also in the middle of a pandemic, which like got old and we don't really care about that anymore, but Remember when it started? It's like you're not supposed to go out because you're going to fucking die. Like going to the store is risk. Um, and you might get COVID and die or you might pass it to somebody else and they're going to die. And this is... So there's risk. So there's risk to talking. Um, it's hard to evaluate those risks. I'm hoping... I'm going to be fine. I don't know if I'm going to be fine. I don't know if my feelings about that are going to change between when we tape this and when I post it, whether they're going to change so much that I don't post it. Um, I suppose like the, there are these questions that are not going to be answered anytime soon for me, but they're, center right now and there are can I do something to help change the situation I don't see anything right now um, what should I do with my own life uh, like I would like to get the fuck out of here if I'm honest as I said I don't see a way to do that maybe I need to figure something out. Maybe there is a way, maybe there's, you know, some little crack somewhere that we can get, uh, through. And then I think a more fundamental question than either of those two, and this is my kind of psychedelic habits is how do you figure out what to do when you don't know what is happening and how this whole thing works, right? So when you're in the middle of some serious psychedelic experience, you have no idea what's going on. You're in an uncharted territories. Reality itself is not behaving the way it's supposed to. And yet it feels consequential and you feel a kind of agency. There's, you know, you're doing something. You're not simply observing it. And you can come to some ground rules. Don't freak out. Don't panic. Pay attention. Um, you know, there are these like less psychedelic advice. Um, but I think there are, I think it's, it's worth it to try to figure out some ground rules that are applicable to whatever. And so the reason I decided that we should talk and I should try to talk publicly and to talk authentically is I think that's one of like, that's been working for me. Just whatever the situation, you know, I'm, I'm having feelings that are difficult to articulate regarding my relationship. I should talk to my girlfriend, you know, I should try to formulate what I'm feeling. Um, and this is just my experience. You know, Navalny's experience is different. He also talks um, that landed him in jail. And before that, he almost died. That hasn't happened to me yet. I'm, I'm, maybe I'd talk differently. Maybe, uh, maybe the main thing is he's talk. We do talk differently, but also he talks in Russian in Russia. I talk to Americans 
on not so large platforms online. And my hope is nobody's paying attention. Um, but uh, anyways, it, it feels like uh, one of these, you know, paying attention works. Like if you, if you, if you manage to do that, that's always better than not paying attention. Um, breathing is a good thing. If you if you notice that you're holding your breath uh, in in a situation where you're, you're not drowning, but you're holding your breath, you should try to breathe. And for me, trying to be authentic in some kind of communication, whether it's talking to you or writing for my newsletter or drawing things or whatever, that helps. Just my life gets better when I do that. And uh, then sometimes I discover that other people's lives got better from, because of it too. So that's what I'm trying to do now without, you know, I, I, I've laid out this like reason for me to, to think that this might be a good thing to do, but this is all based on prior experience. I have no idea whether I'm doing the right thing right now. And I mean, maybe I'm gonna put this up and I am gonna be jailed or something horrible is gonna happen. Uh, but as of now, as of like this day and this time, um, I'm trying not to succumb to that fear and to stick with what's been working for me. Well, I'm glad we talked. Um, I actually have to, uh, I have to go. First of all, I need to go to the bathroom really badly. And uh, <laughs> here's reality coming back. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's what really matters at the moment for me. So Nikita, I, I always love talking to you and it, whether or not you Same post here. this, that's obviously uh, completely your decision, but um, if you want to talk about what's going on over there at any time or talk about something else entirely, um, you know how to find me. Yeah. Let's take it day by day. We'll see. But thank you. Thank you for talking to me today. At the very least, it did, it did make my that day better. Yeah.